This is the Everything EV Podcast by EV Powered. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Everything EV Podcast, the podcast dedicated to everything electric. I'm your host, Charlie Atkinson, and in these episodes, we'll be discussing everything to do with electric travel. So whether it be cars, bikes, boats, or even planes, we'll have it covered. We'll also be speaking to people from within the industry to get their views on the EV space, as well as other features such as electric car reviews, electric motorsport coverage, and much, much more along the way. This podcast is available on all streaming platforms, so be sure to subscribe to wherever you get your podcast from to receive every single episode as soon as it's released. And please do go back and check out all our other episodes too. In this episode, I'm joined by Mac McKenney of the Max Adventure team. Having tackled some of the most extreme motoring challenges around, Mac and his team completed an epic 3,000 mile drive from Oslo to Lisbon last year in a fully electric vehicle. Mac is here to talk about his career so far, where the idea for the challenge came from, as well as answering a few quickfire questions too. So yeah, Mac, first of all, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us today. Now, you've had quite a busy year in 2022, but I just wanted to go to right to the very beginning of the Max Adventure journey. So when did that journey begin and, and how did this team come together? What was the sort of initial inspiration behind everything? Um, well, I'm, I'm, I'm ex-military. I was a trainee fighter pilot, but uh, but not a very good one. So um, there, there, there wasn't a plan B. So I, I, I disappeared off around Africa, driving one of these big overland trucks, um, driving backpackers around. And that was just because I didn't have a clue what I was going to do in my life. And it was a bit of a sort of a thinking, almost like a, a delayed gap year, as it were. Uh, so off I went, came back and thought, oh, I kind of like this uh, adventuring thing, but got no idea how to get into it or earn money from it. And then I uh, heard about the Camel Trophy uh, and entered into that. And of, I believe there was something ridiculous like 10,000 applicants, I don't know. But anyway, I got down to the last four and represented the UK in the international selections. The Land Rover guys and the Camel Trophy guys love me, uh, the PR girls not so. Uh, so they chose a male model and an actor to uh, to represent the UK and the uh, the last of what they call the proper tough camel trophies but that kind of um then i thought okay so i love adventuring travel now i've been introduced to this world of sort of land rovers and extreme driving and i love that as well uh how can i put the two together and um i registered my name with the royal geographical society in london uh to say i was a sort of a driver mechanic from my um africa days um and but before I joined the Air Force, I was in the Army fixing helicopters, but they used to teach you how to fix Land Rovers as well. So I got quite a good mechanical background. And um, anyway, I, I get a call from the Deputy Director of the Royal Geographic Society saying, uh, there's a gentleman that's seen your CV saying you're available for expeditions. He would like you to attend a selection weekend. Uh, here's his telephone number. Give him a call. And it was uh, Sir Ranulph Fiennes, uh, the world's greatest living explorer. And I, I happened to be at my mum's place when I got this call. And uh, as daft as it sounds, I physically stood to attention while I was speaking to him. I felt I couldn't possibly sit down relaxed. I had to be, you know, absolutely, you know, the great man himself. And um, anyway, so I, if I go to Snowden and there are all these ex-SAS and SBS and parachute and all these hardcore military types. And um, anyway, I, I got selected onto the team. So uh, that kind of started it all. And that was 90, when was that? 96. Yeah. Right. So, so from, that, from that moment there to where we are today, what did that journey look like? What, some, what are some of the expeditions that you've been on and some of the most, uh, yeah, some of the most significant expeditions and challenges that you've... you've... Yeah. <clears throat> well, you, using the name Serrano Fines and being on an expedition with him does... If you use it well, it does open quite a few doors and it certainly has done for me. So uh, in, in a nutshell, I although the, the project with RAN was to celebrate Land Rover's 50th anniversary, it was to drive around the world from London to New York via the Bering Straits where Russia and Alaska meet. So we spent three months on the Alaskan side with these tracked amphibious Land Rover defenders, uh, proved we could do the most difficult part of the whole journey, which was getting across the sea ice. Uh, came back, Land Rover ran out of money because they had to launch the Freelander. So um, that project never happened. But obviously I'd worked suitably hard enough and well enough for, for Ran and impressed him enough that I then became his right-hand man on his last North Pole expedition. 
Um, so that got me in with him. Uh, and then I'd obviously impress Land Rover. So they started sponsoring us for different things. So we did a, I'd, I'd seen in the Guinness Book of Records years ago, um, the record for the fastest drive from London to Cape Town. I must've been a sort of teenager. I thought one day I'm gonna beat that. But you can't really go from nothing to racing across Africa, um, you know, uh, to try and beat a record that had been held for, for nearly 50 years by the time we got to do it. So we did a little UK record, uh, all the counties of the UK and Ireland sponsored by Land Rover. Then we did what was called Cape to Cape, top of Europe to the bottom. Um, and then they were sort of our big ones. Um, and then um, through another client, because I was doing some sort of work for classic a classic car company. I was an off-road driving instructor. I was a rally driving instructor. Um, one of the, the, the clients, a very good friend of theirs was Sterling Moss. So Sterling Moss became our patron for London to Cape Town record. And um, I then, we had to, we were gonna film it. So we thought, okay, well, we need to just practice filming. You can't, there's no time to stop, set up cameras, do a nice drive by it. You've got to keep moving. The record's only 13 days to get to Cape Town, uh, 20 odd countries, 10,000 miles. Uh, so we did a, I said, well, we need to practice this. Let's go and do something. And we were just going to go land in John O'Groats a few times. And uh, then I found out that Sterling Moss, as well as being a racing driver and a rally driver, he um, also was like a promotional driver for the Roots Group that owned Hillman and Humber cars. And so they were challenged in 1952 to visit 15 countries in Europe in less than five days to promote the, the newly launched Humber Super Snipe. Anyway, starting in Oslo, finishing in Lisbon and going all the way out to Yugoslavia, they did it in three and a half days. Um, and so that was the next one. And that's when I first met Matt because Texaco, Haveline were our, our main sponsor for that and, and Matt ran all the PR and got all the magazines and newspapers interested. And in fact, it was thanks to Matt that the, and, and all his hard work and promotion of the project that got me probably the biggest gig to date. Um, I'd only been back from Cape Town for, oh, a week. And I got a call from a big ad agency in London called JWT, uh, I think one of the world's biggest. And they were, they'd were they come up with this idea for an extreme driving series. Hollywood actors, sort of motor racing legends to drive the coldest, the hottest, and it was going to be the highest, but we couldn't do that one. It ended up being the toughest roads in the world. And so I get this call saying, can you come and have a meeting? Um, and they literally said, hottest, coldest, highest, Russia, China, India. A six word brief, can you sort out everything? Um, and their attitude was, if they, if I was good enough for Ranulph Fines, I was good enough for them. Um, and that got me the job. There was no interview, there was no presentation. It was, there you are, make it, make it. And so we took the Hollywood actor Tom Hardy to Siberia to drive the world's coldest road. And then Henry Cavill, who plays Superman to the desert of Western China, drive one of the hottest roads. And then, although I did a recce for the, um, or reconnaissance, uh, for the highest road, it never happened. We couldn't get the cars there because Tibet was closed. So we ended up going down to um, Malaysia, drive one of the toughest roads in the Malaysian jungle with Adrian Brody, the youngest Oscar winner. And then that quickly followed on Vauxhall heard about us. So we did a big pr uh, project to drive from Europe's most westerly road in Southwest Island to Asia's most easterly road in Magadan, Far Eastern Siberia, to promote their newly launched um, uh, Vivaro van. Um, also planned the, uh, well, did the logistics for the largest ever medical research expedition on Everest that was filmed by BBC Horizon. Not that I'm a mountaineer, but so I spent um, three months at Everest Space Camp. Uh, we had 150,000 items of equipment in 1,000 containers, i.e. not shipping containers, but, you know, big, big barrels uh, that had to be uh, deposited to seven camps. Um, so it was a massive undertaking um, to do that. That was a two year project. But my, 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 the heart of my interest is automotive. Um, but of course, everything's been done. There's only, there's a, there's a couple of projects. The London to New York has still never been done. Uh, even though Ford tried it, Fiat, uh, Jeep, they've all tried and failed. Um, so that is still yet to be done. Of course, no one's driving through Russia at the moment. Um, but because most of it has been conquered, there's no real challenge in it. And I don't like just driving for the sake of a holiday. I like driving because it's there's a purpose. You're trying to achieve something. 
So I'm very interested in the whole EV thing. And I've been pushing the whole EV thing for a long time because you go back to the 19, between about the 1920s and say the 1980s where cars weren't that reliable. They weren't that comfortable. They weren't that economical. It was all kind of relatively new and untested and untried technology. Manufacturers, and in fact, if you even look on, probably see behind me, there's all these pictures here. You know, there's the, there's the, uh, Sterling Moss one, uh, Ford uh, drove around the world to beat the record to promote the Ford Corsair. There's another one they drove to um, beat the London and Cape Town record for Cortina, to promote the Ford Cortina. They were doing all of these crazy adventures to really push the vehicles beyond their capability to promote new tyres, new engine, new whatever, new oils, new brakes. Um, but of course, since the 90s, there's no, you know, there's no need to do anything. Everyone can assume, you know, a car would do 200,000 miles before you check the oil level. But I've always felt with EVs, that's that, that same uncertainty from the from, from the um, uh, the public. You know, what will happen? What's the range like? How long will it take to charge? Do I want to invest my money into that sort of relatively new technology? And so I've been pushing the argument to manufacturers saying. You, don't rewrite uh, the, the book, as it were. Do exactly what the guys did in the 1940s and 50s, but do it with EVs. And finally, Kia stepped up and said, OK, go for it. And so the first one was the uh, to recreate the challenge that Sterling Moss did. Could an EV now do what he did? And so myself, Matt, and a few others, and some film crew guys, off we go. Uh, initially, my, my maths was to try and achieve it within the five days, the challenge time he was set. Uh, so I was blown away when not only did we just walk the floor with that, but we actually beat Sterling Moss um, and got it in, in in about three, it was, um, we've been in by 47 minutes. So it was uh, 89 hours, whatever, 12 minutes or something, we, we, we did it, uh, which was uh, incredible. Uh, now, yes, people could say, oh yeah, but you know, there's motorways and all the rest of it and blah, blah, blah. But it was a fairly even fight because in the 1950s, uh, there was hardly a car on the road. The Germans still had their very fast autobahns. There were no speed limits, no speed cameras. Um, so, and you had four of the best racing drivers sitting in this car. And it could, it could sit at 90 miles an hour continuously and top well over a ton. It wasn't like it was puffering around at 30 miles an hour. So yes, we had more motorways. Yes, we didn't have to worry about border crossings and showing passports. And there were a couple of bridges where there were ferries before. But of course, we've got speed cameras, we've got a heck of a lot of traffic, and we're trying to do it in a full EV. So I would say it was a fairly even fight to try and race him. And um, we just picked him. It was a bit a bit touch and go at the end when annoyingly uh, the... Um, because obviously you're, you're, you're using sort of... Um, Google Maps, as it were, to try and get from one charger to another charger. It had all been planned. And we had this um, system called a better route planner, which was absolutely fantastic. It worked it all out before we even left the UK. But annoyingly, some, there was a glitch in the system and it put the charging point one side of a fence of a motorway to the other. So we we just didn't know. We, we, we thought, well, maybe there's a charger there. Maybe there's a service station. So we rock up on the wrong side of this fence. <laughs> Oh, it took a long time to figure out how to get to the other side of the fence up and in the dark. Yeah, that was a bit a uh, bit of a heart stopper that was. But yeah, so uh, we, we did it. No, amazing. I do just want to come on, come back on that because obviously, like you said, you were trying to, to push the case for electric vehicles and you wanted to recreate one of these challenges. But when you spend that much time behind the wheel of an EV, what exactly did you learn about electric vehicles that you potentially hadn't realized before what yeah what what did you learn and find out about electric vehicles well i'd i'd um prior to working with kia i'd, I'd never driven one before I'd, I'd sat in a nissan well i drove a nissan leaf for about 100 yards down a runway um and and that was that was my entire um knowledge of ev so i was as apprehensive as everybody else about the charging um trying to do the maths now when you get into a petrol or diesel car, you, you don't sit there and try and figure out exactly where you're going to refuel and which where you're going to, you know, which fuel station you're going to get to. You just get in it and drive. 
and then you just come across a fuel station and go oh, you know I've got a quarter of a tank left I'll just pull in at the next one so I was quite apprehensive and I'd done an awful lot of planning trying to figure out where all these charging points were thinking it was going to be a major mathematical strategic undertaking uh, which probably puts up a lot of people um and yeah so I wasn't I wasn't 100 sure that we could even do it in five days so I um, did another project for Kia. Um, they uh, took um, a car journalist from from Car Magazine uh, to basically to see how far north you could get an EV, and it was part of Car Magazine's sixty brands or sixty years, sixty brands. And for Kia, it was all about EVs and all the rest of it because they're kind of pushing quite a quite a way ahead in the in in in, the, in compared to the, you know a lot of other companies. Kia are definitely out there leading the way on the EV side of things. And so I said to them, well, if, if I'm going to work with you with this driving through Norway and up to Svalbard, as far north as you can get near the North Pole with an EV, can you just lend me one? Because I've got to work out how to drive it and charge it. I didn't have a clue. Um, but, it, you know, you get in it and within, within a few hours and once you've charged it once, once you've kind of lost charging virginity, as it were, um, then it's just it's no different to driving a, a, a petrol or diesel car. It becomes, you know, as long as you know where they are, the charging points, but it's the same as knowing where a fuel station is. Um, became very, very easy. And in fact, I hate to say this, <laughs> the European challenge was boringly easy. The, the car did not, apart from that one glitch when we were the wrong side of that fence, um, it just made it. And, and in fact, we could have probably done that. If we pushed really hard, we could have gone even quicker. And without, as in, you know, uh, just time not trying to speed we always stay within the, the speed limit um so yeah uh, it, it was so easy so easy to do it far easier than i ever thought well yeah, yeah when i just wanted to go back when you mentioned that glitch of the charger being one side of the fence to the other now i'm sure there's loads and loads of challenges that come with either planning a journey and a, and a mission like this and then actually doing it but what was one specific challenge that you faced that you perhaps didn't anticipate to face or one that surprised you the most about the challenge? Um, I don't know. Matt, what, what do you reckon? The, um, there was nothing really. No, I think that... it was the, the, the general kind of unexpectedness because the route planners are very good and they would say, right, you're going to stop for 17 minutes. And that just felt a bit weird. So occasionally we would stop for 20 because there was no hard, you know, we needed those extra three minutes just to kind of collect our thoughts and get some fresh air. Uh, Max will tell you about the, the the charger on the wrong side of the fence and it was a, we were down a farm track the garage and the forecourt was on the main road and we couldn't through the local navigation source uh, we couldn't plan a route seemingly to get there because every route seemed to be wrong but there was little things like when you got there obviously chargers not working or going very slow despite the fact they're supposed to be a rapid charger on one occasion I think Mac was asleep at this point we plugged in we knew we only had to do 20 or so minutes to get to 80 percent because it was a rapid charger I, I think it was one of the ionity ones which as mac has said were very good across the range almost in every country but it wouldn't release we couldn't stop the charge the button on the screen wouldn't work so we, we just basically had to stand around for another 35 minutes almost twice as long to let it get to 100 percent because the charger started to dial back on the on the power delivery and then when it got to 100 percent it went bing thing popped open uh, but that cost us another 35 minutes, which in the overall scheme of things doesn't feel like a long time, but we were consciously always thinking about the time. And so on the video, you'll see moments where we're kind of standing around, around a charging post, kind of scratching our heads, trying to do the math, saying, right, is this fast enough? Are we going to get to the next stop? Are we, are we going to make it? Are we going to make it? And so, yeah, there were lots of little moments, but they probably weren't that dramatic. But when you were, half of you were very tired and trying to get to sleep and the other half are trying to get on the road and cover the distance you need to cover, it just feels, yeah, a little bit, a little bit special. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it was it was a brilliant project. Um, I suppose the, the surprise was the capability of the vehicle. We took an EV6 Air, uh, so uh, two wheel drive. Uh, we'd already done a little project prior to that um so i said to to matt and and nick uh, the other the other drivers uh, and some of the sort of the media guys i said well let's go and have a little practice run <laughs> so we've got half an idea before we just dive straight in and try and take on sterling moss which is 
you know, quite a big thing to try and do as your first EV drive. Um, so I, from a previous project, um, I got permission to drive the highest road in the UK. Uh, what was it? Just under 3,000 feet, about 600 feet higher than the highest publicly accessible road in Scotland. <clears throat> it's a sort of a military radar type station way up in the North Pennines. Um, and the lowest point in the road and also the lowest road is just south of Peterborough. And it's a distance of about 210 miles uphill the whole way from minus nine feet to nearly 3000 feet. And I thought, okay, could this car actually do 210 miles uphill continuously? Uh, so off we go at a very steady 50 miles an hour because we thought we really don't know if it could do this because the book is saying, you know, at best 300 and a bit and on average 250. And I thought, well, yeah, but that's going to be some down as well. And we're just going up the whole way. Anyway, we got to the top of this thing with what, 100 and something, 120 miles left in the tank. It was ridiculous. So then we drove down a bit and gained literally all of it back um, and then went up again to the highest pub in the UK because the, 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 the lowest point and the lowest pub are literally right next door to each other. So we did all that and we still had 85 miles left. Um, so this EV6 Air, I think it worked out as we were driving up the A1 when we got to 50% battery, if, had we carried on at that rate and not started climbing steep into the Pennines, um, it would have been an equivalent of a range of 385 miles which was just incredible, you know. So if you were driving around Holland at 50 miles an hour, that's a 400 mile car, it's gotta be, because we were, you know, going uphill all the time. Um, so that was incredible. So when we use the A Better Route Planner, it says, you know, what speed you plan on driving at and, and a good sensible long distance sort of marathon as opposed to sprint pace. I've always found weirdly is 65 miles an hour. I don't know why. Um, anything more than that just feels like you're in the traffic, you're fighting the traffic, you're having to concentrate so much harder. Uh, anything slower than that, and you're kind of always getting caught up by the trucks. So 65 just seems to be a nice, you can seem to be able to enjoy the view, you're not on the brakes, you're not always up the backside of somebody. But it also coincided with this sort of optimum speed. I think 67 was about as much as you want to go before the battery starts decreasing quite rapidly. So 65 was a really good pace. Um, so although we'd entered all this into the calculations of a better route planner and it told us where to charge on quite a few occasions, we, we, were, we would be arriving at a charging point with 80%. So we just completely leapfrogged it and went to the next one. So that was a real eye-opener of just how capable the vehicle was and the technology that the the ionity system was brilliant uh, the kia charge worked everywhere um i suppose the only frustrations and obviously this is northern europe have really got their act together the italians didn't seem to like putting a charging network right next to a fuel station or right next to a motorway you did end up driving down a side road and down into a housing estate and you know that was a little bit why on earth have you put it? But I guess for maybe the average people that are just pottering it around, it was right next to a supermarket. So they plug it in while they're doing their shopping. So that was a little frustrating. Um, and as you went into Spain, the distances got further and further apart between the chargers. But by that time, we knew the capability of the vehicle, even with three up, even driving at 65, even with quite a bit of kit in the boot. Uh, because the film crew bought quite a lot of stuff, so their vehicle had to stay empty. So we were carrying, the boot was fairly full. Um, so yeah, um, just just brilliant what, what, what the vehicle could do. So yeah, it, it was quite easy. The hardest bit was kind of staying awake and trying to sleep in the back. Uh, but the car breezed it, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Amazing. I did just want to move on. So I, I did just want to finish this interview with um, a few quick fire questions. Now, I know as part of the journey you did, you managed to squeeze in an extra country. So I think you went to 16 countries in total, didn't you? Yes, the, the, the challenge set to Sterling Moss was 15 and five, uh, but he went to uh, Monaco for a quick lap of the, the F1 circuit. So it, it wasn't sort of trying to beat Sterling Moss. Uh, because we could have just stuck to motorways the whole way. Uh, he went over something called the Julia Pass, which is sort of like a seven and a half thousand, eight thousand foot pass in the in the Swiss Alps. Um, so way off the, the the most economical direct 
route with chargers. So that was always a bit, oh, you know, that's a long climb and there's not many chargers over the Alps. Uh, but we did that almost to honour what he'd done and to try and follow his route. Um, so, yeah. So we we also did, did the Monaco circuit just because he did. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. So just to just in honour of that, then, really, I, I've sort of got down here 16 quick fire questions. Um, oh, right. Okay. So see if you see if you can do them in one word, because I, ha I have also just had the annoying warning from Zoom saying our call's going <laughs> to end in 10 minutes. So per yeah. perfectly. I mean, you're used to racing, so this shouldn't be uh, too difficult. Um, so for first of all, your favourite EV. Now, I know you've only driven two, didn't you say? So I'm, I'm guessing it's going to be the Kia. Uh, yes, um, I've I've had I've driven an EV6 GT which we took to Svalbard, um, super fast. But I I would go for the EV6 Air personally. I just love that range. It just reduces, removes completely all anxiety, range anxiety. Okay. Yeah. And the first electric car you ever drove, it was that Nissan Leaf. It was a Nissan Leaf. Yeah, yeah. With the um, um, sort of the one pedal mode where you don't have to touch the brakes. Which I found very unusual, but once I got used to it with the with the Kia, just just fantastic. It was a bit <laughs> when I get back in my old scabby Volvo and you come off the gas expecting it to break at a roundabout and realizing it's not. Oh bloody hell yeah, I better put the brakes on. I forgot about that. <laughs> yeah. Um your your fav the favorite country to drive in out of all of the ones you, you did on the challenge, what was the best country to drive through? What any country that I've ever been to or just the E V six one? Yeah, no, well any country you've ever been to. Uh, Mongolia. Okay, uh, just how, how come? What, what's the reason? Oh, it's 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 huge, and you've got it all to yourself, and and it's stunningly beautiful. Yeah, fantastic country. Uh, amazing. Uh, follow uh, favorite holiday destination. <laughs> uh, because I travel for a living, this is going to sound really stupid. Uh, I've never been on what you call a regular holiday. I've done I've done two skiing holidays when my daughter was younger. Um, so that's my only kind of holiday. Uh, um, yeah, skiing in the Alps, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the best country to own an electric vehicle in, but you, what would what would you say is the answer to that? The best country to own an electric vehicle in. So depending on um, uh, how many charges there are, how nice the country is to drive in. What what was the easiest experience of of being in an electric vehicle? I, I think the Norwegians have got got it hands down because they're, they're kind of leading the way um and again a massive country you've got it all to yourself it's it's stunningly beautiful um and they're totally geared up for the ev world um because you know they're i think they're using a lot of sort of um hydro power and stuff as well to to, to charge the vehicles they're not using smoky coal fire power stations to produce their electricity so yeah norway i've always loved norway okay which country has the best drivers um oh god uh <laughs> Pro probably the scandinavians again i don't probably the norwegians or the swedes definitely that part of the world yeah uh not not the mediterraneans or anywhere further south well i was just <laughs> going to ask which country has the worst drivers then <laughs> oh my word um god uh mauritania wasn't brilliant yeah, they, they kind of thought this, that the line down the middle of the road meant that you drove your car, stra your wheels straddled it. Uh, Saudi Arabia, when we did the London to Cape Town record, they didn't mind which side of a dual carriageway. The, truck, the trucks didn't care what side of a dual carriageway they were on, which was a little bit unnerving in the middle of the night to suddenly find massive headlights coming towards you, realising this is on my side of the, motor, of the dual carriageway. So, um, yeah, be careful in Saudi Arabia. Uh, a country you've not been to yet, but you've always wanted to go to? Um, almost got the chance, but COVID killed it. Uh, I haven't been to South America yet. So uh, I, I saw the Top Gear Bolivian special. So Chile, Bolivia, yeah, that part of the world, Argentina, um, the, the, the high, um, high plains of, of, uh, sort of Bolivia and Chile. Definitely want to do that one day. Okay, perfect. And now just a few general ones. Would you rather take the, the scenic route or just get there as quickly as possible? Um, well, if I'm beating a record, as in London to Cape Town, then I have to go as fast as possible. But, I'd, but if not, then I would always take the scenic route. 
Yeah. Um, a playlist, put the radio on or listen to an audio book while you're driving. Oh, playlist. I need, I need some good, um, some good 80s tunes to keep me going. Okay, brilliant. Uh, one random thing on your bucket list. Uh, well, that, that London to Cape Town record still needs to be beaten and I want to be the person to do it. Right, okay. No, good answer. Oh, no, sorry, sorry, London to Cape Town. London to New York. It's never been done before. Not... Yeah, London to New York um, still has yet to be done because it's so damn difficult. So I want to be the guy who does it, yeah. Brilliant. Um, if you could convert one classic car over to electric, what would it be? Um... I know people are doing a lot of Land Rovers. I can't see the point of that personally. Uh, I would, I think the only car that really, of a classic that would really suit electric, I think would be like a Rolls Royce because they just, you know, they go to such great lengths to make it as smooth and quiet as possible. I think an electric motor in a roller you know, would, would enhance it even further. Yeah. Yeah. There is one coming soon actually. So, um, um dream road trip would it be the london to new york again um that's more of a kind of a hardcore expedition uh a road trip i would uh i would i would probably yeah L london to sydney actually there was a there were these classic rallies in the 60s late 60s london to sydney rally love to do that Okay, brilliant. Uh, favorite in-car snack? Oh, probably one of those Haribo Tangtastic packets, but I really shouldn't eat them. But because once you start, you can't stop, can you? No, brilliant. Um, and then, just lastly, the your dream celebrity road trip partner, dead or alive, anyone from history, who who would you love to have next year, just to pick their brains? Um. I've I've met Charlie Borman from Long Way Round. I would love to meet you and McGregor. Uh, and just hear all about his motorbike adventure through through uh, Asia and Mongolia and Siberia. Because I've, I've done it. I'd like to get his take on it. I think that'd be fantastic. That's all for this episode. Many thanks for listening. And if you liked it, then please do check out all our other episodes. And be sure to subscribe to wherever you get your podcast from to make sure you get every single episode as soon as it's released. For daily news coverage, features and much more, you can also head over to evpowered.co.uk. Thanks once again for listening and we'll see you on the very next episode of the Everything EV podcast.